Patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction have elongation of cardiac pair, myocytes with no increase in width, myocyte necrosis plus degradation of extracellular collagen, eccentric uh, LV remodeling, LV dilatation. All these things will take place. As the LV dilates, it assumes spherical shape, increases wall stress, more LV remodeling, poorer clinical outcome. And in all these, echocardiography will help you. As LV dilates, you can find out the LV size. As it is assumes spherical shape, you can find out the sphericity index. As there is increased wall stress, you can find out that which, which walls are truly uh, fibrotic. And once remodeling takes place, and I will show you all these things. So the important point is, that along with pathophysiology, echocardiography is there in the clinical, uh, cl clinical realm of the patient. So let us start. We have here a 49 years old male who presents to us with progressive increasing dyspnea on exertion for two months. This is, he's admitted in our ICCU with left ventricular failure. He's NYHA, New York Heart Association, Class, functional classification class four. He's non-diabetic, not a non-hypertensive. There is no family history of sudden cardiac death or heart failure or CAD. His vitals, height, weight are 157, weight 60 kilograms, blood pressure 130 by 80, but the respiratory rate is high, the pulse rate is high, and the chest auscultation reveals basal crackles up to the one third of the chest. So he's in gross left ventricular failure. His mild elevation, his creatinine is 1.3, urea is 33. But look at the anti-pro BNP, 5,270 picogram per milliliter. His biomarkers, blood sugar levels, lipid profile at this point seem okay. ECG shows a narrow QRS with sinus tachycardia. Just look at his chest x-ray. Immediately, it takes you 10 seconds to say, this gentleman has a left ventricular failure. So the first thing that, is, that we do in our hospital is to put a 2D echocardiogram. And as you can see, even here, you can see very clearly that the walls are thin, the, eject, the LV is dilated, and the ejection fraction is very poor. This is the short axis view, and this is the four chamber view. So you see how within 20 minutes of this person's entry into the emergency room, you actually actually come to know what this patient has. Go forward in the four chamber view where you are nicely seeing the mitral and tricuspid valve, you also see there is moderate mitral regurgitation. And again, you can see that the LV function is abnormal. But it's not about pretty pictures. It's also about Doppler echocardiography. Doppler will give you the hemodynamics. Now you see here very, very clearly that the, that the deacceleration slope is just 120 seconds. And when you come to the pulse stop, the tissue Doppler imaging, you see that the E wave, E, e prime is so small. And and I'll come to these in detail. And when you look at the global longitudinal strain, the global longitudinal strain shows you a global a ejection fraction, a global longitudinal strain of hardly minus nine or 10. So you see, this person is in gross injection, gross heart failure. Tricuspid regurgitation shows a, a elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And you can see it here very clearly. This is the pulmonary per artery hypertension is increased. And the E by E prime shows that the LV EDP is elevated to more than 14. So if you sum these things up, then you will realize that you have got the pulmonary artery hypertension, you've got the LV ejection fraction, you know the dilatation, you know the mitral inflow pattern, you know the mitral E by E prime. These things will help you guide fluids or diuretics, vasodilators or inotropes, beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. It may also tell you that this is this an equation to put the intraaortic balloon pump. And it will also tell you the timing of coronary intro intervention. 
And of course, there is a prognostic assessment can be made right here. Also, you will get a very good idea of the right heart filling pressure by looking at the IVC diameter and the collapse of IVC diameter. Here you can see how widely it is dilated and it's hardly any collapse there. That means that the right atrial mean pressure has increased. So you see, you have got the complete hemodynamics within minutes of your applying the 2D echocardiogram <clears throat> transducer to the patient's chest. So if you, if you sum up the, of the <coughs> salient features, the echo shows dilated left ventricular cavity, 6.4 upon 5.9 centimeters. You have dilated left atrium, 4.5 centimeters. The ejection fraction is just 15%. The global longitudinal strain is minus 6.8%, where it should be minus 22, minus 21. So it is grossly deranged. You have moderate MR, restrictive mitral inflow pattern, and a PSP of 43 millimeters of mercury. So what does this give you? It gives you a very, very sick patient who has come to your ICU. And until and unless clinically and echocardiographic recognition of that clinical dilemma, you, take, you do not take the right decision, the patient will have a grossly bad outcome. Also, because he was 49, after, after stabilization, an angiogram was done, and, which, and the angiogram revealed that the coronary arteries were normal. So it's probably his first presentation as dilated cardiomyopathy. Here, the LV pressure was 95 by 25, and the LV EDP was 28, and the PAP was elevated, just like you got it non-invasively from your echocardiogram. So on the third day of the course of his course in the hospital, he became clinically stable. He had good urine output. We stopped the list, frustamide infusion and the NTG trip. We increased <coughs> evabridine, added ramipril, started bolus furosemide twice daily. And on the fourth day, he was clinically stable, shifted to the wards. And a pre-discharge echo showed at least some improvement <coughs> in the global injection fraction, as you see the parasternal long axis view, you see the short axis view, and you see the four chamber view, and you see the, let the anterior wall and the inferior wall. So you see how echo is with you all the way. And now the mitral regurgitation is little less. The E wave is big, E and A wave are becoming better in the tissue Doppler imaging and already the global longitudinal strain is better, and the E by the deacceleration slope is also better. So you see, at every step, if you give the right treatment, the echocardiogram is showing you, yes, there is slight improvement. And you look at the inferior vena cava, now it is not dilated. So you know that you have decongested, you have decongested the patient pretty well. So in the third follow-up visit, two months after discharge, asymptomatic, he was walking in-house, metoprolol succinate was increased to 25 milligrams twice daily, rest medications were continued. On the fourth post-op visit, six months after discharge, he was clinically stable, blood pressure was 100 by 60, pulse rate was 64, evabridine was stopped and ramipril was stepped up. So after six months, the 2D echo, was definitely better, but it wasn't so good as we would have expected. But certainly, if you look at the uh, E by F, the E by A ratio is, is measured. The deacceleration slope is, is better. It's now just 59.7, and the ejection fraction was also slightly better. So, And he is moving about doing his normal work. But because the LV systolic dysfunction persisted, the LV dilatation continued. We converted the ramipril into Arnie. You have to wait for 36 hours before you can start of stopping ramipril and then starting Arnie. But because now the pressures were, the blood pressure was better, we put him on 100 milligram twice daily 
of psychometrical well sort in combination which he tolerated well and now he was in new york heart association association grade 2 so now you see 2d echo after one year the vo2 max is 24 ml per kilogram per and a 6 minute test was much better so with good treatment with eyes open on echocardiogram by looking at hemodynamics very very closely you have achieved something which otherwise would have been impossible that you have got a good ejection fraction now you can see what medicines to give to this individual and how you will take it forward so on one year follow up symptomatically he was better the nyha functional class was one he denied two offers for heart transplant as he was feeling better and was continued on metoprolol succinate arni twice daily we, we stepped it up because the blood pressure was now better and the vo2 max was 21 ml and the lvef improved to 45% so we have now caused a reverse remodeling that the lv end diastolic dimension was elevated lv end systolic dimension was elevated now they are coming down to 4.6 and 2.5 this is normal range so you see how with good use of your clinical sense your biochemical evaluation and by the use of echocardiogram you have achieved something which was possible not which was not possible a few years ago and of course good pharmacological th therapy was of course at your back but you have utilized it when when where when uh, you, you knew you have to use it and the anti pro bnp is extremely important i should have also mentioned how the anti pro bnp decreased and how arni was levels were increased no <clears throat> so is ejection fraction enough no not only ejection fraction but we have also used tissue doppler imaging we have also used global longitudinal strain we have also used uh, doppler parameters of e by a, e by e prime and the d mitral d acceleration slope but of course ejection fraction we all has become a part of our everyday language when we talk about cardiac patients we say well what's the ejection fraction and just to take you through one one study which was published in the journal of the american college of the, the journal of the american society of echocardiography this is a huge study 27323 patients with lvf measured and 19445 matched controls were followed for 2 lakhs 23,034 person years, and you can see, and these are all hospital patients from various categories, but they just noted the ejection fraction, and the cumulative incidence of CV events on is on this side, and the follow up years is here. Now, if you look at it, those who have ejection fraction less than 25 percent, between 25 to 35 percent, between 36 to 45 percent. and between 46 to 55 but look at their cumulative incidence of cv death so we have one question from dr narendra verma sure that uh, why dapa lifrozin was uh, sglt2 was not started early yes that's a very good question we give it now routinely but this when this this patient that i have chosen at that time the glifosin not uh, routine to be used in heart reduced ejection fraction i have used this example to demonstrate very clearly ventricular remodeling and reverse ventricular remodeling but at that time they were not uh the drugs of choice that was Thanks. the reason but that was a good question and a good observation now of course we all use dapa as well as arni and also ampagliflozin in patients who have heart failure with preserve ejection fraction so this is an important study that the ejection fraction as the lower the ejection fraction the higher the mortality and that's why there is so much emphasis on ejection fraction but here i will take 
one minute that it should not be just eyeball. We should really do it by the Simpsons method and write it down very carefully. Because a casually taken ejection fraction, if you say, oh, it varies between 30 to 35, then the people will say, well, why didn't you put the ICD? He's a dilated cardiomyopathy patient at high risk. He was showing ectopic beats in the whole to monitoring. So you have to be very cautious that to which category it belongs, less than 25, 25 to 35, 36 to 30. And other thing that is important is anti-pro-BNP because that will show you how the, eject, how the heart failure is getting under control. Then cumulative incidence of heart failure hospitalization, again, a huge parameter, huge parameter. LVEF and heart failure hospitalization and CV mortality go hand in hand. Again, you can see those who have less than 25 and those who have 46 to 55, the cumulative heart failure hospitalization is very so, so much depending on your ejection fraction. And therefore, in our unit, though we have access to huge numbers of machines, uh, which can do global long longitudinal strain, but still we will give, we are giving a lot of emphasis on ejection fraction.